Welcome to the Work From Home Future, how technology leaders are revolutionizing work. Thank you for joining us today. We are very excited that you have joined us to discuss what the future workplace means for IT. Thank you to our partners, Google Chrome Enterprise, for helping bring this event to life. We want to hear from you during this conversation. We will be utilizing Slido as a way for you to engage with the event. You will see it displayed to the right of this video. Through Slido, you could submit questions to speakers during the event. Moderators will do their best to address the submitted questions, but due to time constraints, not all questions can be answered. You will also see polls throughout the event, and we encourage you to vote once they are live. These polls will pop up in the Slido widget when prompted. With that being said, let's get started with a poll to kick off our first conversation. How satisfied are you with your current technological solutions from work from anywhere productivity? Very, somewhat, not very, or not at all. Now please welcome interviewer Alex Conrad, Senior Editor, Forbes, and John Solomon, VP Chrome OS, Google. All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, excited to have this conversation. Uh, the first of several we're gonna be having um, this afternoon or morning based on where you are. John, it's really a pleasure to be chatting with you today about sort of the boundless workplace and how I think this massive work from home shift is, is affecting kind of productivity and, and how we set things up um, to be the most productive, you know, in this new environment. So. Um, for the benefit of our audience, John, do you mind just telling us a little bit about your background and sort of um, what expertise you've brought to your role um, at Chrome OS right now? Yeah, thanks, Alex, and uh, great to be here. I really appreciate the opportunity to join this audience. Uh, so um, I, I run uh, the Chrome OS business. I'm the vice president of that at Google. And, um, you know, I've had the, the benefit um, uh, of being in IT for quite some time, so I've seen a lot happen. Um, I got to experience firsthand uh, the dot-com bust. Um, I got to experience 2008. And now uh, with all of you here, I've got to experience uh, coronavirus and this epidemic. So it's been an amazing journey um, from personal and professional perspective. Um, and I've worked for many years in technology, starting with HP for a number of, a long time. Uh, then I went to Apple. And now I've had two years uh, running Chrome OS with Google. Um, and this has been truly the most exciting uh, period of my career thrilled to be here. Awesome. And so um, I'm curious, as we get our uh, results from our initial poll, do you have any guess of kind of what you expect people will say about how happy they are with their work anywhere setup right now? I, I'm sure you talk to customers and, and others, and I'm curious kind of what you hear and what you expect we're, we're about to see. Yeah, Alex, this has been the, you know this has been the huge challenge for so many companies, large and small, uh, ad adjusting to work anywhere. And there's really two kinds of companies: um, companies who, um, broadly speaking, who were quite far along or were ready with uh, cloud-oriented technology. Um, so with endpoints like Chrome OS, where they were able to quickly deploy rapidly at low cost and simply, uh, were pretty well positioned. And we saw those kind of companies, I mean, there were some challenges, but they were able to make the transition pretty easily. Um, companies that were maybe earlier in the journey or hadn't really uh, thought about um, a cloud technology uh, from an endpoint perspective really struggled because they, they had to completely redo um, the, the application layer and just uh, they had to really rethink things from the beginning. So some companies found it tremendously hard. Others um, were amazingly agile in the ability to get work done uh, from home and make that transition uh, literally within a week. Got it. Um, I'm curious, uh, you know, what have been your thoughts just about sort of um, the the workflows that have been evolving or kind of the, the, the changes that have happened, you know, in this short term that perhaps we didn't anticipate or that all of us have had to think about whether we were farther in that journey, as you just noted, or, or perhaps newer to it. Yeah, I think, you know, the, 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 when you boil it down, the two or three things that have really made a difference are, um, first of all, did you, from a security perspective, did you have a security approach that allowed for um, this massive deployment of endpoints outside of your, your local, you know, physical place and do that in a way that was secure? So I think kind of having a sec security um, through end-to-end -end from endpoint to, to your servers 
And this is where technology like Chrome OS was really beneficial. So security was a big one. The second one was virtualization. So we've seen um, you know, massive growth in virtualization solutions. And this is really important because for many companies, you know, not everybody can live in the cloud all the time. There might be a need for a legacy application or live on the web. They may need access to a legacy application. So we've seen really a big growth in, in virtualization solutions running on Chromebooks, for example. Um, so that's been one which um, has, has uh, really shown acceleration. And it's shown IT how um, the, this concept of being able to manage a desktop um, in, in a remote location with a combination of a secure endpoint with virtualization where needed uh, really works well. Has anything surprised you or um, anything gone smoother than you anticipated that gives you sort of optimism or comfort kind of about how people have been, you know, responding? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the interesting things we've seen, and it surprised us, I mean, we we're, we're pretty optimistic about Chrome OS in, in general, but what we've seen is the growth rate um, and just the adoption of Chrome relative to other technologies has really surprised us. Just to give you some hard numbers on this, we saw 155% growth in uh, the commercial channel, which is where the, the channel that companies essentially are buying products uh, in the first quarter. So this is you know, w way more than doubling, if you think about it, two and a half times the growth, um, which far outstripped the overall PC category. So the thing that really surprised us was how many IT admins actually chose Chrome as a solution. And when we asked them why, it really came down to three things. Uh, was simplicity, security, and the ability to be able to do it at low cost um, was were the factors. Makes sense. Um, well, I have good news. Our our poll results for the first question are in. Um, so we'll see if the audience um, kind of feels the same, uh, you know, sentiment that you do, John. Um, so it looks like forty four percent of respondents say they are very satisfied with their current situation for work anywhere. And 55% are somewhat satisfied with, you know, their productivity set up there. Um, and then of course, you know, the rest is, is splitting that, that final 1%. Um, yeah. What, what would be your response to those results, John? You know, so I think, I think we're entering a, a very interesting phase here. I would say the people who are very satisfied are obviously ones that are making the technology work really well for them. I think, in, you know, to think about the, the technology, for the setup at home to work well, um, two things need to, need to be in place. Um, one is you need to have, you know, really good, secure um, video conferencing. I mean, it sounds so obvious as what we're doing here today, having this conversation, but that needs to be established and that needs to be a good solution. Um, we're, we're using, you know, Google Meet here today, obviously there are many others, but um, that's one. Secondly, you need to have applications that are well suited to remote work and that allow people to collaborate easily um, in a way that they don't feel disadvantaged from a productivity, productivity perspective working from home. I think when those two things are in place, um, you get a lot of benefits. And, you know, Alex, one of the really interesting things we're seeing is pre-COVID, we did a lot of research around work and we found that a lot of people would like to be able to work from home at times. But oftentimes it wasn't in the company culture. There was a little bit of a sense of like maybe Maybe it wasn't like, you know, you weren't as serious if you worked from home. We see that really changing, Alex. And we see that that's, there's going to be a more, for companies that have recognized how successful this can be, they're going to be much more open to giving employees that option. And it's not making some sort of special accommodation, but making it something that very productive people can do at any time, given the right tools and technology. Um, I think lastly, I'd say for the companies that are still, you know, uh, somewhat satisfied, um, it's clear that they, um, technology can really help them. And um, I, I, I'm not saying for a moment that everybody should work from home all the time, but I think having the technology that allows to do, you to do that without a penalty is super helpful. That resonates with me. Um, I definitely, in a perfect world, I think would be uh, interchangeably going back and forth based on the type of project I was working on or what else I might have going on. But I definitely would like the option to be back in the office, uh, you know, sometime soon. Yeah, I think we all, I think we miss our colleagues and the human contact, and I wouldn't underestimate that for a moment. It's very powerful. Um, you know, I think this idea of just having a bit more flexibility around that is is really key. And, you know, I think there, there are social benefits, too, that we've we've talked about um, in, in other conversations around um, 
uh, whether it's congestion, you know, particularly here for those of you who live in the Bay Area, um, seeing fewer cars on the road is beneficial to society overall. Um, frankly, also global warming uh, benefits as well from, from fewer trips. So I think as um, we step back from all of this and say, how do we find a new, a new way of work? Um, having this, uh, this increased flexibility that includes more work from home is net beneficial not only to employees, companies, and to society at large. So um, I think it's time to encourage our audience to um, weigh in on their second question of our conversation, which is, um, you know, what is the most important uh, factor for you in assessing the best tools and solutions moving forward? We gave a few options that we're going to talk about as well. Uh, price, user experience, security, and breadth of features. Um, John, as people weigh in, I'm curious, how do you think about those different, um, you know, sort of vectors and, and what is your true north when it comes to a successful setup? Yeah, I, you know, we're very user centric. I think that we, we, you've got to make sure that the user, the employee, the user at the end of the device is, is getting maximum benefit and get their work done. So never want to lose sight of that. Having said that, I think once you have make sure that the user has the applications they need, they can quickly get in and out, they can do the work they want to get done, they can collaborate. Then looking at um, technologies that allow for simplicity, uh, ability to be able to manage with the small staff. You know, if you think about it, like companies are, are, are facing uncertain economic times, many companies right now. And, and you know, whatever we, we read looks like this could be the state for a couple of years, right? We could be in a um, a difficult some economic headwinds. So capital is is hard to come by. And so I think you think about you want to have the right applications. You want to be able to do this in a way that is um, simple and be able to be managed. But you also want to do it at low cost um, because, you know, there's there's obviously less money to go around from a, from a capital expenditure perspective. So those are some of the filters we look at. Start with the user. Can the user get their work done? Then look at technology that's secure, easy to manage, and can I do it at low cost with, with not a ton of people? IT doesn't want to spend, IT has many things on uh, that they need to do, and managing endpoint products is not something they should be spending tons of time on. You want it to be largely automated, simple, easy to do with a small number of people. Got it. Um, you know, and, and I know you mentioned security. I'm expecting that might be an important factor. Um, you know, I, I we've heard at Forbes of a few CIOs who have been wondering about, you know, are they are they facing many more endpoints of vulnerability or or a much more complex setup um, with people working from anywhere? Um, could could you go a little bit deeper about how you think about that and what makes you comfortable that you know this is still a good setup? There? Yeah, no, it's a great question, Alex. And, you know, security is one of the pillars of the of the Chrome operating system. It's something that we had the benefit of designing a new and modern operating system much more recently. So this allowed us to really think about security as as a fundamental. And so with Chrome, um, so yes, conceptually, when you when you have a lot more endpoints deployed remotely you've increased potentially your attack surfaces for, for you know, bad actors. So I think for, for IT, they really need to think about what technology they deploy um, that, doesn't act, that doesn't increase the risk. And this is where Chrome OS comes in because it's a secure from the silicon level all the way through to the cloud um, system. It just does, it has far fewer surfaces or vectors where you know where things like malware phishing ransomware they, they just don't happen on chromebooks so this allows um, it to not worry about that um, of course they, they still need to do you know need to make sure that um, they're doing things in the right way but one of the huge benefits is you is in many traditional os's to be secure you have to make sure that everyone's on the same version of the os and you have to make sure they have the latest version of their antivirus and all the right settings have to be turned on. And so this is a headache for IT because how can you be sure that thousands of endpoints are all kind of set the right way? With Chrome, it's secure by default. You don't run an antivirus and everyone is on the same OS. It's homogeneous. So this is just a completely different environment. It removes a huge layer of headache and frankly, uncertainty and risk from the profile of, of what IT has to deal with. Well, we have our results in, and um, 
you were you were actually right. Uh, you started with user experience, John, and that was a sixty percent of the response. Um, security, the one that I was looking at the most, was second at twenty five percent, and then breadth of features eleven percent, and price three percent. So it looks like uh, you know people want tools that work right now. Maybe they're not so much concerned about just the cheapest one. Um, any any surprises there, or if not, well, you know, Alex, I'm, I'm glad you actually said the low low percentage on cost because actually cost is not. We don't look at cost as the cost of the device. I think the cost of the device, um, and I think that's kind of what the users with were, uh, the folks who voted were thinking about is actually a nice device that's that's you know something you and I would like to carry around is important. Uh, in fact, we've been working with many OEMs to improve the quality of the devices. It's when when we talk about cost, it's from a total cost of manageability and security, the whole the whole system cost. Um, so I think that um, that's a really good uh, call out from uh, from the viewers here to say that you know it's we ultimately when you're sitting on a device all day, none of us want to be on a device that feels plasticky and the keyboard travel isn't good and you know it's the screen's not nice and bright. So I think that um, we don't want to cut corners on the device itself. Uh, that needs to be important because actually that's an extension of user experience if you think about it right the device sort of is integral to that um but i think that uh the fact that security was right up there is is really kind of very much in line with its user experience security the you know how the device works for me am i getting my and i think when people say this concept of do i have the right applications this is key right you you can't have people working remotely if they can't access, they're not gonna be productive and happy if people can't access the apps that they need to get their work done. And if the apps are somehow like, uh, you know, hamstrung, that's a problem. So we've been putting a ton of work into working with big developers, small developers to make sure that the apps they are working on um, can work well remotely on a Chromebook. Because sometimes these apps were designed originally for native, um, you know, running natively with local data. So making sure that there's versions of those applications that can run on a cloud-based system um, is critical. John, I wanna to get to a couple of questions from our audience um, before we have to wrap. Uh, the first one is, um, what is your own ideal work from home setup? What, what apps are you living on and, and sort of what, you know, within Google and, and at least your team, what do you find are your sort of go-to uh, devices or apps? Yeah, so, you know, I'm, I'm a, what we call a knowledge worker as opposed to a developer, right? As a, I'm, not, I'm not a software developer, although I, I love software and spend a lot of time uh, thinking about it. Uh, so really, you know, what, what I found, and this has been an amazing experience for me um, coming to Google and being here for two years now, I live in, um, in in the Google in the Google applications um, on my Chromebook. So I live in in G Suite, and you know one of the things that I think many of us take for granted now, but I've been surprised how many companies are still working in in, in the way where they're. Uh, not in the modern collaborative way, where in other words, they're still sending emails to each other with with files attached to them. And you know, once you've made that transition to applications that you that you share, um, it's just such a different and such a more pleasurable way of working uh, when you know everyone collaborates at the same time and it's so much simpler. So, as I work in the in the G Suite um, applications, often someone will send me an application from, for example, um, you know, the Microsoft Office Suite. And the great thing is now with um, with G Suite, you're indifferent really. You can you can um, view, edit, comment, and send it back uh, natively as well. So you're not going through nearly as much complication on the translation side. Um, I also take advantage of uh, some of the Android applications that are available. Um, as you probably know, that the full Android Play Store is available on Chromebooks. So uh, we'll dive in sometimes, and uh, sometimes when I've got a few minutes, I'll play some games or. Um, there are a few interesting applications in the enterprise space that are on Android too, so that uh, creates additional flexibility. This was not an audience question, but what is your what is your one game? What is your favorite game right now? <laughs> I'd have to say like solitaire. I just need to. Okay, okay, a classic. <laughs> um, last audience question that we have time for, um, but I've really enjoyed this is just um, as people think about maybe a second wave or another pandemic, um, another. Uh, crisis in the future, you know, God forbid when that would be, um, what systems should they be keeping in place or thinking to have in place 
um, ahead of that so that even if we all go back to work partly, let's say in the fall or whenever that may be, they're ready for whatever that next event would be? Yeah, it's a great question, Alex. And I think um, the way to think about this is that, you know, in the past, a lot of companies had these kind of what we called business continuity plans or redundancy plans. And it was sort of a check. Honestly, it wasn't taken very seriously, or it was more to do with, you know, kind of crisis management. Um, now, of course, no one's not going to take that lightly anymore. It's going to be something that is really taken seriously. And um, I think it comes down to really having a plan that your, your workforce is enabled to get the access to the tools and data that they need for mission critical applications that can keep the revenue of the company going, meet customer needs wherever people are. So this, this idea of sort of um, fewer boundaries and having making sure that data can be centrally located so that you don't have to make this transition from local data to, to um, you know, centralized data is, um, you know, is, is really paramount. And for companies that were on the journey to the cloud, this has provided an accelerant. What we, what we see happening here is the future that was already um, a trend over the last five, seven years, and we saw sort of steadily marching on for the next five years, has been telescoped into 2020. And so companies need to accelerate that transition, be ready for a more agile environment where people can work anywhere, and, be, and this way they could take on something like this in the future if it had to happen. Well, John, thank you so much for sharing your expertise. Um, excited to see how the panel that follows us can maybe build on some of the themes we've just discussed, but really appreciate you sharing all this with our audience today. Yeah, thanks a lot, Alex. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. And I'd, I'd like to finish by saying we're super optimistic about this transition that's happened in IT. We think it's actually great for users uh, and great for IT. You know, sometimes you have things that are good on one end of the spectrum and, and not, not for the other. This is one of those in situations where everybody wins. Um, you know, of course, there's change management involved, but ultimately, the, it's, it's really exciting. It, um, it gives users what they need, gives IT uh, better security and manageability, um, and, and we get to have more uh, flexibility in how we get things done. So um, I think it's, it's a win-win. Sounds good to me. All right. Well, thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you, Alex and John, for that engaging conversation. Now, as we look to discuss managing a cloud workforce, we'd like to ask, what is your biggest concern moving a company's network to the cloud? Security, keeping employees productive, lack of expertise and resources, or compliance? Please submit your answer in Slido. We'd now like to welcome moderator David Jeems, staff reporter Forbes, and panelists Mark Eimer, SVP and CTO, Hackensack Meridian Health, David Reese, EVP and CIO, Hackensack Meridian Health, and John Solomon, VP Chrome OS, Google. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, for, thanks to our audience for uh, joining us today. Um, I also encourage you all to uh, continue to submit questions as we go along. Um, just kicking us off, uh, Mark. I mean, Hackensack Meridian Health has 17 hospitals and about 34,000 employees. So I'd love to know how COVID-19 has forced you, you know, as CTO to sort of rethink the company's technology strategy. Yeah, well, thanks, David. I mean, as, as you can tell, COVID hit healthcare really hard. Um, and what was even sad um, is during COVID, so many different cyber attacks on healthcare were occurring at the same time during the pandemic, right? And just like every other industry where we had to get people to work from home quickly, um, one of the key things for us, um, and I'll re-echo what John Solomon said earlier, right? Security, uh, simplicity, uh, and cost, right? So uh, we were outlaying a lot of capital at that time, and we needed a very simple and secure solution to give people uh, the tools that they needed uh, to work at home um, and leveraging uh, the Chromebooks and leveraging um, our virtualized solution Citrix uh, to give them the same user experience that they have at home in the office really helped us to change the landscape of how we could quickly pivot and get people working from home and still be productive. Um, David, as, as CIO, I mean, 
I'm, I'm really curious to know how like the leadership structure has, may have changed uh, during this period, maybe since March um, at um, Hackensack and Meridian Health. Um, you know, I mean, I'm not going to go as far as to say the CIO has a different role now to the CEO, that's a bold statement, but, um, you know, has, has your role specifically changed? Yeah, it, it, it has pretty, pretty dramatically. Um, what we really had to focus on more more recently is where are the business exact where are the business processes that need to be digitized in a way that they're were used differently than they were in the past. So I think from a CIO standpoint, it, it's far more about what are the workflows that all of our clinicians and um, you know kind of back office employees use, and then how do we need to digitize them and deliver them differently than they did when they were in the office? Things as simple as faxing or uh, being able to sign documents. Uh, that, that changed all dramatically when, when, when we're no longer in the office. So, uh, yeah, I mean, kind of thinking about the business process and the clinical process is what has changed the most for me. And, and I guess, like, just while we wait for the results of our of our first poll question to come through, uh, Mark, what has been some what 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 has been the biggest concern for for um, um, Hackensack? I mean, is it security, keeping employees productive, lack of expertise and resources, or compliance? Well, I think. Um... You know, security and productivity, I think, were the key concerns, making sure that people could still be productive at home. Uh, and to David's point, um, do they have all the tools? Did they think through, you know, the basics, faxing, e-signing? You know, we did a lot of things within the four walls, and we relied a lot on paper. And then when everyone goes and works from home, from the video conferencing solutions to how do I collaborate as a team moving forward? So a lot of the basics that you sort of take for granted when you're in the office, you don't have, you have to figure out and work through some of those basics with people working from home. Um, so it took a little bit and we pivoted quickly, um, but it did take some forethought to figure all that through. I'd, I'd say that you're, uh, you're definitely in line with some of our audience. Uh, we had 51% of people said that security was the biggest issue. Uh, keeping employees productive was 24%. A lack of expertise and resources uh, at 23%. And not too many people are worried about compliance. About 3% um, of people said that that was their top issue. Um, so with that, we, we also, the other sort of key question, and it's a, it's a, it's a metric that everyone seems to be throwing around is, is what is going to be the ratio of work from home versus in office for your employees? I mean, you guys, again, employ 34,000 people. That's not a small workforce. Um, you know, is it, do you expect that once we return to a new normal? And again, that's a broad statement. I mean, are we looking at a 25% um, ratio, a 50% ratio of, of people working from home versus coming to the office? Or, I mean, as, as a health organization, um, Perhaps, David, if you want to take that one. Yeah, I mean, and that's part of what we, we think about is, you know, not everyone can work from home. There are, with 34,000 team members, 17 hospitals, um, hundreds of individual care locations, there are certain things in our business process and our clinical process that just can't be delivered from home. What can be delivered from home is increasing, but it certainly isn't the full suite of things we do. Things like getting an x-ray. The x-ray technician that administers the x-ray has to be on site. The patient has to be there. So when I, when I think broadly about what does it take to run our, our 17 hospitals, what does it take to do imaging and lab work? You know, I think from a, a vast majority of our team members and our clinical care providers, uh, it's still a, a, a on-campus based world for us. Now, when you change that to some of the outpatient patient care and we change that to corporate services, there, I think what we've demonstrated pretty quickly is a vast majority of that work can actually be delivered, if not fully from home, um, almost entirely from home. So I think on, on the ambulatory setting, um, when you think about a, an e-visit with your family physician, not all, but a lot of that can be delivered uh, virtually. So I think you know, we have to kind of break our user and employee populations up into segments and say some of those segments, it's a 0% work from home and uh, while other segments, it's almost 100% work from home. So I think you know, if I had to put a number on the 34,000 and how many could work from home, you know, it's in the thousands, maybe upwards of 10,000, but probably not more than that, just given how hospital centric we are and 
how much has to happen inside a hospital. So about a third. I mean, you'd also probably um, assume that that might be consistent across the entire healthcare industry. Right. Um, so just while we wait for the results of that poll to come through, John, I'd, I'd love to sort of know from, from Google's standpoint, um, how the needs of your, con your customers, obviously including uh, Hackensack Meridian, you know, have changed since March. I mean, there's just, we sort of touched on this in, the, in, the, in your previous chat, but, you know, I, I feel I, I would, I'd be really interested to know sort of what, what, what requests are, are sort of coming your way. Sorry, John, I think you're muted. <laughs> I want to say one quick thank you, David. Um, I want to say one quick thing on the on the prior conversation. You know, just to add to that, which is that the um, you know who works from home and what percentage of people. I think this is something that's going to evolve, um, and as you know, uh, people figure out like w what's the best to do. But this concept of um, one of the things that we've learned through this period is when you know change doesn't happen in a linear way. Um, it tends to, and and what we've seen is because we were all forced to work from home we all figured out a lot and um an example is uh you know i'm glad this that mark brought this up and, and dave did on, on telemedicine telemedicine is definitely going to be uh much more rapidly adopted uh, post this than before and uh, i'll segue that into what we're hearing from customers because uh, we serve a lot of of healthcare customers uh, at google um and the two the two segments that um i think are going to have uh, i would really sort of uh, I, I see having one of the biggest changes from this are um, our healthcare that was already going through a digital transformation, um, uh, you know, due to many changes in technology and, and pressures on that industry. Um, and so healthcare is really, is really going to be looking at uh, delivery and looking at how technology can help delivery and looking at and dividing up their, you know, their types of work. Um, and I, I'm really glad that Mark and Dave talked about for example, um, you know, follow-up visits, different kinds of visits that can be very efficiently delivered via telemedicine um, versus others that are obviously must be in person. Um, so we're, what we're hearing from customers since March is really thinking about work and thinking about the nature of work and what kind of work is well suited to doing to be done remotely versus what kinds of work um, really requires collaboration on an, a daily and a much more regular basis. So I think that's you know, we've at, at Google, we've quite some time worked with companies delineating between what we call knowledge workers and frontline workers based on the sort of applications they used. But now you're seeing another sort of angle on it, which is actually which of this work can be done remotely versus what needs to be done in the office. And that has a knock on effect on technology because you then look at, OK, it's not necessarily just knowledge worker, frontline worker. It's what kind of tech uh, it's it's remote versus in office. And then for anything that's outside of the office, the technology stack needs to be cloud centric. It needs to be easy to manage and deploy the things we talked about before. It does look like we're still waiting for a few of those uh, poll results to come through. I guess I, 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 I mean, I, obviously, I mean, just going back to your point, um, David, you said that, you know, that, that's almost a third of your employees are going to be potentially working from home. Um, you know, once things sort of level out a bit more, how have you sort of assessed the change in your technology spend? Um, you know, and, and has that, is this something that's actually increased or decreased or are there other sort of measures that you've sort of taken to have to accommodate that change? I think it, what we've seen from a, a spend standpoint is the total amount we're spending isn't necessarily changing, but what we're spending it on is changing pretty profoundly. And so I think that's kind of when you think about the way IT organizations would have worked in the past, there'd be a lot of technical debt that was funded and you, you'd spend a small amount on future technology and, and the majority of the amount on uh, the spend and effort will be on managing the legacy applications that have been in place. And I think what we're seeing now, as John mentioned, is a rapid shift and a greater ability to retire and sunset those legacy applications, which used to endure for a long time before and uh, are now rapidly being retired and sunset in favor of new digital technologies that have more of an anywhere, anytime uh, usability aspect to them. So I think the overall spend is relatively the same, but what the spend is on is dramatically different. Yeah, all okay. right, sorry. Yeah, David, can, can I comment on that too? Because I, I think that um, that's right on. Um, the, um, 
you know, what, what happened in a uh, change management in IT uh, a lot was there was always reasons why new technology couldn't be adopted. And what we saw happening with new Chrome adoptions is it usually would take, there would be a pilot period, which usually would go like 90 to 120 days. And then decision-making usually took, you know, one to two quarters, like six months, a lot of times. And instead what happened here, and in, during that time, you know, IT was working through what we would call objection handling. You know, can't do this. I need this application. I still have to have these 10 app, apps that are all local. Um, what happened here was because of the urgency and the real focus of companies needing to just get, get be running, the, the objections fell away. And what became clear, what, what was really important, and um, as David said, uh, IT to, had to take a really hard look at a much more accelerated um, sunset of legacy applications that were used by a small fraction of people that could be done through another application. And this is a huge aha moment because what we've realized, I think, collectively as an industry is that we were being held back by um, a 5% that was preventing the 95% from moving forward. Um, and, and and this is like what, what makes us feel very uh very optimistic about you know the future of technology for for managing endpoints and and uh, the benefits to users in IT. I mean that's become quite a um, uh, almost like a um, an overused line lately. Is you know in the last I, I believe even um, a Microsoft CEO said in his earnings call is that we've seen more adoption of the cloud in the last two months uh, in the last two weeks than we have in the last you know, two years or something. So I mean. Going forward, I mean, do you think that that adoption is only going to double down or do you think we're going to see it sort of peter out and maybe plateau the rate at which companies are adopting? Or do you think we're like barely even there? Yeah, I think um, so. The way we look at it is, as, as I mentioned, is that there was already a growing adoption of these cloud centric tools like Chrome OS. And, it was, you know, if you look at the data before um, before COVID, uh, it was growing faster than the you know regular clients. But it was still, you know, a small part. Then what you had was this one-time stochastic shock, if you like, just massive, where you know everyone, like everyone on this call, had to work from home, and so there was this really, really rapid adoption of these technologies. Um, and and the question you're asking, you know, which is a great one, which is what happens afterwards and how long does it tr continue? Um, the way we think about it is that it will, first of all, it will settle down, but at a much higher point than when prior. So the sort of starting point now is, is post-COVID. Um, and whether that's something like telemedicine or whether it's just adoption of these remote technologies needed for work from home. Um, but then it will continue at quite a, a strong rate because the, here's the thing, the, the inherent technology of cloud-based computing is just better. It's better from, it's much simpler. It, 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 it's much lower risk. And there's really no reason to go back. Um, if you think about it from your personal uh, your personal life, you know we're in we live in a mobile world. We all carry smartphones with us, whether we're Android or or use iOS. We would never think twice, never go back to a, a world where your data, your data that's in the cloud on your phone, is somehow somehow you know predominantly local. Like that, that's just not a concept anymore. So as in our personal lives, we've all moved to cloud-based computing. But what's happening is an enterprise is basically behind consumer. And enterprise is now realizing all these massive benefits of having centralized data, of being able to, if, for example, on a Chromebook, somebody loses it, gets stolen, they just can, it can immediately be centrally, uh, you know, disabled. It can be, once you've logged out of it, there are no footprints. These kind of benefits are here to stay and, and no one's going to want to go back. Um, so we think this is a really a long-term trend that will just be really change how IT is deployed. But just, just, just oh, sorry, just a counterpoint to that. I mean, do you think though that once people do start going back to the office, even if they are in reduced workloads, that we might see some companies maybe retract their cloud use, um, and you know, then sort of turn back to the old way of <laughs> the old way of uh, you know in in office networks. No, you know, look, look, some applications need to be done locally. I mean, if you're a designer and you're doing, you know, you're doing. Um, uh, serious design work on an Adobe product, for example, that is a product that, that's the type of work that, you know, not a lot of people do it. I think um, Adobe would tell you that it's, they call it the 3%. So 
it's a small number of people doing very high value work that is much best suited to, to native applications. But it turns out for every designer, there's at least 10 people who need to then look at that design, comment on it, edit, mark up, give feedback. All of those 10 people downstream from the original designer can get all their work done in a cloud-based application and they can do it anywhere. So I think we see other workflows like that where there's just examples of that kind of thing can happen. And, and certain applications need to be local, others need to be in the cloud. We do have actually some results back from that initial poll on those ratios of, of what the workforce will go back with. Um, for Hackensack Meridian, you guys, and I'm just again going back to that, about a third of your workforce, so 10,000 people going back. Uh, our audience thinks that once the new normal comes in, it'll be about 25% uh, of their workforce uh, will be working from home. That's 39% of respondents said 25%. Uh, and half, uh, about that 34 people in the audience, 34% uh, of people in the audience said about half of their employees will be working from home. So these are, again, sort of seismic shifts in um, just the way that we engage with work. Um, I mean, is there any sort of immediate responses to that? No, I, I would say that's probably pretty spot on. I mean, I think um, from a Hackensack Meridian Health perspective, our original concern, I think, again, was productivity and security. Um, and as we've polled managers and employees, uh, we've found that um, productivity is higher uh, with people working from home, uh, to almost to the detriment where they're, they're working longer. Right, so um, so we know that the productivity is um, is not being impacted. Actually, it's uh, being exponential. And then, how do you pull that back? And then, how do you mix both that hybrid model of knowing that people are going to continue to work from home or come in two days, work from home three days? So I think you know, to John and David's point, I think that's the new normal. Uh, where any solution that you deploy today has really has to fit a virtual office environment and be able to work for any person on any device, uh, any place, as long as they have power and internet, um, you know, that I think that's going to be the new norm. So with that, actually, David, I'm really curious. Uh, I mean, actually, to both of you, I'd love to know sort of what technology specifically you've sort of um, identified in the last two to three months that have, you know, totally enabled uh, this, you know, again, this huge change in the way that your workforce is operating. Um, I mean, obviously this is the stuff that you guys do every single day. So I want to sort of know what's on your desk. Yeah, so I think one, and is it's not necessarily a technology item, but it's a really important item to enable the technology is working with finance and the CFO to adjust the way we fund IT because, and some of the participants in the audience may, may be going through the same thing that I am, which is cloud gets funded out of operating expense where legacy applications get funded out of capital. <laughs> and you tend to have greater access to capital uh, than you do to operating expense. And so from, from a CIO standpoint, one of the key things is to work with finance to shift how IT is funded so that you can afford and support these cloud-based applications, which are subscription driven. And I think that was one of the keys to our success kind of in January and February as we ramped up our use of cloud technologies to be able to support uh, a mass work from home is really working with finance to make sure our budgeting was tracked and, and accounted for correctly and at the same time funding those changes. And I think two of them that I would point out are virtualization of our legacy applications is one. And then one I hope Mark will talk a little bit more about is rapidly being able to stand up in the home contact centers. Right. Most of patients come to us because they call us and we used to have those call center agents come to a location and quickly we had to figure out a way to get them home. And so those were kind of, I think, two of the key enabling technologies that happened very fast. Mark, did you want to weigh in? Yeah, I mean, to, to David's point, um, for the last 20 years, um, everything that uh, had been architected had been around the four walls and coming into work and doing your job on site. And then very quickly, knowing that we had to get about 80 call centers, um, approximately 500 people 
working from home, uh, doing call center work so that people, patients could continue to call us. Um, that was a quick pivot. So uh, probably within the amount of two to three weeks, we, had, we pivoted very quickly from 500 people and 80 call centers on-prem uh, doing their job to all of a sudden working from home uh, off of Chromebooks uh, in a web-based world. I mean, it was, uh, it was phenomenal. Uh, you know, every, uh, to, to John Solomon's point, a lot of skepticism. I don't think it's going to work, right? Um, but then you sort of, they don't have the option to object. It's you must do it and you must make it work. And they did. And it's been a, a huge success uh, to the point now where uh, we're actually expanding that um, and continuing to look at other opportunities uh, that we can in that avenue. So I know that there's a there is a growing trend. Uh, I mean, growing maybe an overstatement, but I know that there is a lot of companies that use this sort of multi-cloud strategy as well. I know that uh, Hack and Tech Meridian use both Google and Azure, and I just wanted to do sort of a really quick explainer of why companies do do that. Uh, so I'll start, and I'll let David chime in. Um, so I think the the thing around hybrid cloud, multi-cloud strategies is that you know, cloud providers are not um, uh, isolated from having outages themselves. Uh, and so when we deliver patient care uh, and we have critical applications um, that require continuous availability and concurrent maintainability, then, uh, and knowing that some of our vendors have preferred some environments over others, um, it just gives us the flexibility to be able to meet any need at any time uh, and ensure the continuous availability, concurrent maintainability model. David? Yeah, in addition to that, I think, you know, not all clouds are created the same and different clouds have different strengths. And I think part of our multi-cloud strategy is let's, let's align our needs with the strengths of the various cloud providers. Um, and you know, not and to use a, a sports analogy, not ask someone to play out of position, but really take advantage of the strengths that are inherent to each cloud, and they're each a little different, and each have different advantages. And John, just just on that point, I know that uh, you guys obviously have the Anthos uh, platform as well. That's all the same. Um, uh, so we get to the uh, but, you know, what, what's what's sort of Google's approach to you know the, 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 the why companies do go to multi-cloud and then. You know, you guys also provide your product and you also enable a coherence between all the other providers as well. Yeah, I mean, we, we realize that we need to meet customers where they are. And and so, you know, some customers may, um, uh, for the reasons David said, may have, they may already have a cloud um, provider. Um, they may have uh, certain applications um, or um, have already invested a fair amount in, in a particular cloud solution, or they may be just looking for redundancy. So we really recognize that the, the market is, is complex. And for some, uh, they may need all, all they need from uh, what Google Cloud can bring. But for many of our customers, uh, and you know, it's an increasing number, um, it's a multi-cloud environment. You, you would say that the majority of customers definitely, uh, typically will see a uh, multi-cloud approach. I think it depends on the nature of the customers. Very large customers or uh, certain segments like healthcare and financial services tend to, to look at that. Uh, but it all it, it, it is dependent on location uh, and the type of industry. Um, and I would say though that you know the endpoint strategy is independent of the cloud strategy. So you can run you know if you're running Chromebooks for example, it's not dependent on running um, you know a particular cloud stack. We're we're independent of of the cloud. Got it. Um, we do have a couple of uh, audience questions that did come through. Uh, what, the first one's for Mark Imer. Um, uh, how, how much of the technology used during COVID uh, were in-house uh, prior to the outbreak? So uh, almost were, were you caught flat-footed or, you know, were you kind of, you know, already running? I wouldn't say we were caught flat-footed. I mean, we had already started to pivot um, in that direction. Um, and I think John John Solomon said this earlier. Uh, we ended up pivoting. Uh, velocity was was a key word that we used uh, during COVID, right? So things that would have normally taken us 
six months to do, uh, we got done in a week or two, right? So there was a lot of condensed focus in accelerating the strategy that we had already put in place. Um, and so being able to do that actually helped us along uh, immensely. But to, you know, we talked about the contact centers. Um, we hadn't pivoted there yet, right? So that was one where I wouldn't say we were caught flat-footed, uh, but we had to pivot very quickly in leveraging the cloud solution of the provider we were already using uh, versus the on-prem. So, uh, so those were some of the things, but the majority of what we leveraged is some of the stuff that we already had going on. We just accelerated that moving forward. Did you want to weigh in as well, David, on that? Or? Yeah, I think Mark's being a little modest. Um, <laughs> <laughs> kind of in January, it became pretty obvious that from an IT planning standpoint, we needed to make sure we were already moving in a certain direction so that we weren't flat-footed. And, and Mark quickly assembled a team kind of the second half of January that kind of got us moving so that we weren't flat-footed. We were already going in a direction. Uh, we already kind of knew what things we were going to do in what order. So, uh, you know, I think credit to Mark for really kind of getting over that inertia in early January so that by the end of January, we were already moving in a direction. I would, we just have uh, one other audience question as well. And then I have one more that just, uh, that just I just thought of actually. Um, but uh, just again, again for um, David and Mark, um, you know, how, how do you address cybersecurity, patient privacy and regulatory requirements um, with the telehealth work from home um, dynamic? Yeah, so I think it's, the good news is, is it's not too different. It's not too terribly different. Um, when you think about the way we deliver care today, so, so geographically spread out across Northern New Jersey with high population density, uh, we were already doing a whole lot of kind of virtual collaboration and virtual care delivery already. So we just kind of built upon that. Um, you know, I think this is a classic uh, case in healthcare though, where the regulation is a little behind uh, the consumer trends. And so we're trying to have to kind of do a little bit of contortion around payment models and around delivery models to make sure that um, revenue continues to flow, uh, bills go out the door and patients get cared for most importantly, but do that in a way with a, a, a regulation set that was put into effect in 1996 and written before that. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're dealing in, in a world that's uh, pretty heavily regulated and those regulations are decades old at this point and, you know, have not necessarily been kept current. Um, so that's kind of one of the ways I think from a security standpoint, though, I think that's one of the, the reasons for us to push to Chrome OS um, for all the reasons that John talked about earlier, in particular around endpoint protection, lack of ransomware and easy manageability in, in device encryption and a lot market in any details. Yeah, we've we, we got about 30 seconds left, it looks like, actually. So, so jump in. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, to David's point. I mean, the, the electronic health uh, vendor um, that we use um, already has an end-to-end -end secure solution. Um, so integrating the video conferencing into that, uh, so the patient portal that they use um, to what the physicians would use to conduct the e-visit, uh, it was a pretty seamless transition. Uh, and to David's point, um, most of the hurdles have been on the regulation side that I think, I think moving forward won't be the issue moving forward uh, because I think that is going to be the new normal. All right, it does look like we're out of time. Um, and I would love to thank our panelists. I had a, I had a really good time actually. This is, this is a lot of fun. So thank you. I'll, I'll yeah, pass, thank you very much. I'll pass it on to uh, <laughs> Everyone, you might have just heard me start to say this, but um, we just wanted to thank you all again for, for joining us today for all this programming on the work from home future and working everywhere, how technology leaders are transforming work. We do hope that you enjoyed this experience and found it engaging and informative. Uh, we want to thank our speakers one last time um, for sharing everything with us, um, both in our fireside chat and our panel. And a big thanks to Google Chrome Enterprise for their partnership on this event. We couldn't have done it without you. And please, uh, one more time, please go to Slido to take our post-event survey. We do appreciate any and all feedback. Um, if you can't do that this minute, that's totally fine. There will be a follow-up uh, email where you can also get the link to that survey. 
thank you so much and have a great day.